Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about populations. So by the end of this video, three things I need you to know or be able to do. First one is to discuss the impact of population growth on the environment. Second is to compare and contrast local, urban, and global impacts and understand the impact of affluence on eco footprint. Today's video is basically going to be about the ways that population growth impact the environment and the ways that wealth impact the environment. So let's go ahead and jump on in. First thing I want to talk about today is just generally the impact of a growing population on the earth. Now this is going to seem like a duh statement but I need to make sure that it is made. Um, more people means greater environmental impact which makes sense if you think about it because if you got a person, a person has needs and those needs include things things like food, shelter, water, um, ways to stay warm, access to education, um, a way to get around, food to eat. All of those things are needed by the average person. So every person that you add to the earth is going to consume the resources they, they need to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. So just make that general connection. Make sure it's very clear in your head. More people means greater environmental impact because each person requires resources that have to be taken away from the earth. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about population growth here for a little bit. Um, population of the world is currently over 7 billion people and is projected to top out somewhere between 8 and 10 million people between 2050 and 2100. Now this graph right here shows you essentially where in the world most of the population growth is supposed to occur. Um, down there on the bottom you will see that orange chunk of the graph. That represents the industrialized world or developed nations. The yellow sitting on top of it represents developing nations or third world countries or peripheral nations or whatever you would like to call those parts of the world. Um, and this kind of shows their graph over time of their growth. If you look at industrialized regions of the world, you can see that those parts of the world have had steady to flat growth rates over time and maybe even a decreasing growth rate towards 2050. If you look up towards the developing part of the world, you can see that starting around 1950, there is exponential growth happening in developing regions, and that would be as they move through that demographic transition we talked about. They have moved on into that stage three, or stage two or stage three, where the death rates are falling off because they're starting to become more developed, but birth rates are still very high for a number of reasons. So it's really interesting and slightly unsettling to note that the regions of the world that are least equipped to deal with a growing population are the places where the most population growth is currently occurring and is predicted to occur over the next 50 years or so. Now we want to start tying this to eco footprint and in a previous video I think I mentioned eco footprint but I want to make sure that we're very clear on it. Eco footprint is a measure of the goods and resources that are used by a person. Um, it is measured in hectares, which remember is a measure of the unit of land. And that hectare basically talks about how much land is needed to support a person's lifestyle, meaning to produce their goods and take their waste and all that stuff. Um, an eco footprint can also be said to be a measure of affluence. Affluence is just the wealth that a person has. Generally, people who are more affluent have more things, they consume more goods, they produce more waste, so their eco footprint is going to be bigger. If you want to compare country to country, America has far and away the biggest heck or the biggest eco footprint per capita of any nation in the world. Um, and it's very sad to say, but a few countries in the developing world consume most of the global resources. So I'm going to show you a chart here to kind of uh, bring this home or make some comparisons. So a couple things that I want to note on here. The global average right here is 2.7 hectares per person. So this means that the average citizen of planet Earth needs about 2.7 hectares of land to meet the needs of their daily life. Now, if you want to go down this way into the world that is developing, you go China has a per capita footprint of 1.8 hectares, India 0.9, the Ivory Coast in Africa 0.8, Haiti, which is the least developed country in the West, has a eco footprint of 0.5 hectares per person. Now, let's go the other way. You got Mexico, Germany, Japan, Canada, Australia, and then all the way up here is the U.S. The average American citizen needs about nine hectares of resources in order to meet the needs of their lifestyle as they currently live it. So 
per person, the average American is going to consume somewhere between four and five times the amount of resources of the average global citizen. So this is one of the reasons um, that America, while it only has 6% of the world population, consumes about 30% of the world's resources because our lifestyle is so much different from people in the rest of the world. And as we're talking about affluence and kind of calculating the affluence of a person or a country, there's an equation called the IPAD equation. Now don't worry, you're never going to have to do math with this because it's not something you can really put um, numbers to. It's just more of a thinking structure. So if we're going to talk about the impact of a country on the environment, a couple of factors we want to look at. We want to look at the population. Obviously, higher population is going to have a bigger impact than a smaller population, assuming all other things are equal. We're going to take that population and we are going to multiply it by the affluence. So how rich are the people within that country? If you've got a big country with small affluence, so lots of people but the people aren't that rich, your impact might be about the same as a small country with rich people. And then you're going to take that and multiply that by technology. Now technology can factor in as being either good or bad. Um, countries that have become fairly highly developed, so America, Western European countries, for the most part technology in those countries has been used to reduce the environmental impact of each person in that country. Now, if you want to look at a country like China that is rapidly developing but has not yet reached the level of, say, America or France or something like that, technology for them is harming the environment in that they're using a ton of coal-fired power plants in order to make their electricity, which is really hard on the environment. So depending on what type of technology you're looking at, that could either increase or decrease the impact of a country. Now I want to scoot a little bit over and talk about local versus global impacts. And this is basically talking about the scale of impact of a country on the environment. Now, most developed countries have a global environmental impact, while most developing countries have a local environmental impact. So let's break those down and talk about them a little bit. So first of all, developing countries, countries that are in the process of moving towards being developed, they tend to have more of a local environmental impact. And the reason for this is that they get everything that they need from their immediate surroundings or the countries that are right next door to them. It's not like they are sending out for goods and services from across oceans or other continents um, and they don't have a whole lot of infrastructure. So everything that they need to get by on a day-to-day -day basis is coming from right around them. So developing countries you tend to see um, environmental impacts such as overuse of the land, crops depleting soil, um, local resources being depleted, um, waterways being polluted. All of that is happening in their quest just to get by. So developing countries, their impact is going to be more local. Now, if you look at developed countries, global players, um, G20 countries, most of our impact is going to be on the global scale, and that's because while we do produce some things within our borders, a lot of the stuff we get is imported from somewhere else. Fun fact, the average piece of fruit or vegetable on your plate has traveled like somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 miles just to get to you. So rather than producing something locally, we outsource that to other places, which means they have to deal with all of the pollution. Um, but our impact is also seen in that we've got to transport things back and forth, and as things are manufactured or transported, there's pollution that is lost to the air and to the water and to the soil. So we impact global systems like the carbon cycle and the water cycle rather than having small local impacts. Because of all of our trade and our lifestyle, we have a broader global impact. And then we want to talk a little bit about an urban impact. So first we got to define what is an urban area. Urban area is an area that has more than a thousand people per square mile. Um, if you are living in a developed country, good chances are that you live in a city because 75% of people living in developed countries live in cities. Um, living in a city can both increase and decrease the impact of a person or per capita. So you can look at it a bunch of ways. You could say that your average city dweller is probably not going to drive nearly as much because everything is nearby or they can take public transit. So if you're talking about like emitting a CO2 in the atmosphere because of burning fossil fuels, they're probably going to have a smaller eco footprint than somebody who is living in an area where they have to drive a lot. But you can also say that a bunch of people living together concentrates a bunch of waste in one area, which is really hard on the environment. So depending on what you are looking at, city dwelling can either increase or decrease environmental impact. Sorry about that edit. So 
<clears throat> Presently, one billion people of the world's population live in slums. And slums are just areas around a city that have been hastily constructed. People have moved to a city for you know, jobs or opportunity or whatever else. Um, most slums obviously don't have sanitation. They don't have running water. may not have access to electricity. Um, so an area like a slum has a pretty strong environmental impact because you've got a bunch of people together, their waste is all together, and it's not being dealt with in a proper way. So the situation of people living in slums is another example of um, urban areas having a greater environmental impact. And two things to finish up. Um, I want to talk about the impact of affluence. And this is something that I've kind of danced around and mentioned, but I just want to say it um, straight on. Uh, people in countries that have more affluence, have more wealth, have a greater environmental impact. Generally, you can say that countries with a bigger GDP, gross domestic product, will have a uh, bigger environmental impact than countries with a smaller GDP. And that's because the people in those countries have more power to buy things. They have more access to goods. They have more accesses to service. So in general, just by virtue of where they live, they're going to consume more things. And this is it, the elusive sustainable development. So as we're talking about all this, we know that world population is probably going to increase by at least 2 billion more people. We know that most of that growth is going to happen in the developing world. Um, we know that a lot of this growth is going to happen in cities. The problem that everybody is grappling with is how can we help these areas to grow in a way that is not detrimental to the environment, which seems almost impossible because, like we said, more people consume more resources. And you know, people argue back and forth like, well, on one hand, people living a greater quality of life generally means that they're going to have fewer kids, total fertility is going to go down, and eventually they will move into a realm where they have enough money to be able to buy technologies that decrease their impact. But and then on the other hand, you know, there is just the simple fact that having more people increases impact on the environment in general. So there is fields of economics, of science, of politics, of education, all concerned with how can we develop sustainably. And you know, some people have got ideas here and there. Um, they're all really interesting, but to date, nobody has really come up with one coherent plan for helping the world to develop in a way that is more sustainable. Probably the best bet that we could shoot for is to help to develop the world in a way that we are improving the standard of living for everybody that is on the earth. Now, obviously, if we're improving the standard of living, people are going to have a higher eco footprint because they're going to be consuming more goods. But we also know that an increased standard of living is going to mean that they're going to have a lower total fertility. They're going to have fewer kids, which means that population growth is going to slow down. And eventually, those people will move into a bracket where they can afford the technologies that will decrease their environmental impact. So that's just one thought. There's a ton of argument on the subject. but. I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.